The end goal of my teaching you all of these reactions is, of course, for you to apply them to total synthesis. I'd love to show you a bunch of examples of total synthesis here, but if I did that, then we wouldn't have as much stuff to cover in class. So I'm going to save those for, in, uh, our, uh, for when we're together in class. Now I want to just review a couple of really cool examples of carbonyl compounds being used in real life just for the fun of it. Just so you guys know, this is the structure of fats and oils. The only, the only practical difference between a fat and an oil is that a fat is a solid at room temperature and an oil is a liquid at room temperature. What in the world makes something solid versus liquid at room temperature? Well, as it turns out, it is the identity and structure of these three R groups. Generally speaking, the longer and the larger these R groups, the more likely it is going to be a solid at room temperature. If you have more branching in these R groups, then it tends to contribute to it being a liquid more. And if you have, of course, short R groups here, then it becomes uh, more and more likely that it will be a liquid. Structurally speaking, though, the generic structure for fats and oils are the same. As it turns out, you can take a fat or an oil, heat it with water and sodium hydroxide, and the hydroxide will come into this carbonyl at each of these positions. Electrons go up, electrons go down, and they kick off and liberate the oxygens. That gives you this product, glycerol, and these three structures. As it turns out, these structures are the structures of soap. So each individual soap that you might use or see or have heard of might have a different R group attached here, lending to its different structure. But this is, in reality, how soap is made. As it turns out, long ago, soaps were often made by people in the frontier regions of the world by taking fats from animal fat and heating it with hydroxide obtained from lye and water to then liberate these sodium salts. These sodium salts are, of course, soaps. I want to teach you now the difference between soaps and detergents. While I realize one of the differences is that detergents has more syllables and different letters, there is also structurally a difference. A typical soap has a carbonate or sodium carbonate head. Now you can have soaps that have different counter ions other than sodium that will lend to different structures as well. Detergents have sulfonate anionic heads instead. They also can have alternative counter ions instead of sodium, such as potassium or magnesium or calcium, for example. But this structurally is really the only difference between soaps and detergents. Functionally, they do function differently. And you can, uh, you've probably experienced that as you've used soaps in your personal lives and detergents and seen that detergents do tend to remove uh, filth in a different way either better or worse than soaps, depending on the problem at hand. You might ask the question now, how do soaps work? Well, as it turns out, if we go back to our previous slide, you can see that soaps and detergents both have a carbonate or sulfonate head. This head is very, very polar, which means it likes water. That is, it's hydrophilic. Both soaps and detergents also have big, long hydrocarbon chains. These chains are very, very nonpolar, which means that they don't like water. They're hydrophobic. When you get soap molecules together, what they typically do is form these spheres in which the carbonate, that is the polar heads, are pointed outward, and these big, long, greasy, Car, uh, hydrophobic tails are pointed inward. This type of spherical structure is called a micelle. This is what soaps do when they're exposed to water. All of these carbonate heads point out, outward toward the water, and all of these greasy hydrophobic tails point inward. 
This is the reason why soaps and detergents can remove nonpolar things. See, as it turns out, if you look at your hands and they're dirty, the dirt is actually a mixture of lots of different compounds. Many of those compounds are polar, and many of them are nonpolar. If I take dirt or grease or something else on my hands and I put water on it, what's going to happen is the water, because it's polar, is going to easily wash or rinse away all of the polar molecules in that mixture. However, the water will not be able to rinse away very easily, or at all, any of the nonpolar compounds in that mixture because they are not hydrophilic. That is, they don't dissolve in water. Soap and detergent sort of have the best of both worlds. They have these polar heads and these nonpolar tails. So when they form these spherical micelles, what occurs is the nonpolar tails point inward and grab anything that's nonpolar stuck to your hands or your clothes or whatever else you're washing, while the polar heads point outward and grab hold of the water molecules. This enables soap to stick to nonpolar things while also being able to be rinsed away by the polar water. The next subject I want to address is how nature activates carboxylic acids. As I mentioned, the OH groups in carboxylic acids are not the best leaving groups. Nature, uh, in living organisms including us, has to have the ability to remove OHs and replace them with other things very, very frequently. How in the world does it do that? Well, what happens is nature often replaces OHs with these groups, which are called phosphate groups. You might uh, have seen structures like this in biology courses. This is an acyl phosphate, an acyl pyrophosphate, when there, there are two linked phosphate moieties, and an acyl adenylate. This is where there's an adenyl moiety attached to your phosphate. These triphosphate structures should look familiar because they're found in ATP. This is the entire structure of ATP. It has an adenosine, a sugar moiety, and this triphosphate backbone. Triphosphate backbone attached to the adenosine moiety can be shorthand written as this. One question you might ask then is what in the world does nature do with these phosphate groups? Well, it likes to sequester ATP in various sites inside cells and other tissues. And then, when a carboxylic acid needs to be activated, the deprotonated acid can attack one of these phosphorus atoms and then displace these electrons to free up an ADP, which is adenosine diphosphate you then have formed an acyl phosphate, which is an activated carboxylic acid. This phosphate group is a much better leaving group than the OH group. An alternative way of replacing an OH with a phosphate group is by taking this deprotonated carboxylic acid and having it, it attack the central phosphorus atom in ATP. This releases adenosine monophosphate and replaces the OH with a pyrophosphate group. A pyrophosphate group is also a much better leaving group than an OH. A third way, of course, as you might have anticipated, is to have the deprotonated carboxylic acid attack the third phosphorus. And upon doing this, it, also, it generates an acyl adenylate and releases pyrophosphate as the leaving group. This ends our discussion for chapter 17. I hope it's been as exciting and as long for you as it has for me. Stay tuned for chapter 18 videos which will be posted very soon.